Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Poser, and I'm with the NOAA Central Library, who is hosting today's uh, part one of two on climate misinformation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom DiLiberto to introduce our speaker today. He will also be the speaker on Thursday for part two of this climate misinformation seminar series. Tom? Thank you so much, Katie, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I'm just going to jump right into and introduce our speaker, uh, Margaret Orr. Margaret has just finished her third year as a PhD student at the George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication. Her research, perhaps obviously since we're here today, focuses on misinformation, specifically looking at whether trusted sources of climate facts can be trusted and effective climate myth busters. Uh, Margaret's background is in atmospheric science. She graduated from the University of Delaware with a bachelor's in meteorology in climatology in 2018 and from the University of Georgia with a master's in geography in 2020. Uh, she was a previous NOAA La Penta intern in the summer of 2020 and has also worked uh, with us at climate.gov on the social media team on a literature review highlighting the importance of debunking misinformation via social media comments. Thank you for joining us today, Margaret. Thanks so much for having me, Tom and Katie, and thanks everyone for hanging out with me today. Um, I'll jump right in into my presentation, the title of which I um, did borrow from Miss Taylor Swift. Um, Wildfire Lies is a lyric from her song Mean from her Speak Now album. Um, so we are going to jump right in um, and first talk about what exactly is misinformation. There's a couple different definitions that kind of float around out there. Um, and these are two that I have pulled out in my own dissertation research working on misinformation um, that I find to be most useful. So this first uh, top one here is that misinformation is information that is false, inaccurate, or misleading. And I want to highlight there that it does not necessarily have to be completely false. It can be inaccurate misleading, something that doesn't tell the full truth. So things like cherry picking a climate graph, uh, when we see like a cooling period, you know, that is true, but it is misleading with the regards to an overall warming trend. If we're going to say that, you know, the past two years of cooling negate however many years of global warming. Um, there's another definition um, that defines misinformation as contradicting best available scientific evidence. And I think this one is important because we know that science does evolve and change. We learn new things. Um, you know, we gain new knowledge. Um, and I add to this tag here that's without proper scientific justification. Um, so we have information that contradicts, but that is contradicting without a proper study. You know, we are where we are because of advances in science and things that we didn't think could happen before, but those have all been done with this proper rigorous scientific study, um, peer review, all of those things that we um, know and love. So then misinformation is information that's contradicting without those um, forms of justification. There are also different names for misinformation or um, different things that fall under this umbrella term of misinformation. And the first one that we're all familiar with, I'm sure, is fake news, which is misinformation that is disguised as a news item or as a news article. Um, we can see this example on the right here um, is kind of a very obvious fake news article, kind of very obviously clickbait, Mark Zuckerberg, dead at 32. Um, this is something that might be a little bit more obvious, um, but this is what fake news looks like. It's got a headline. It appears to be um, appears to be news. And then we also have disinformation, and this has a lot to do with the explicit intent of spreading the misinformation. Um, where disinformation is mis misinformation that is spread in order to mislead the audience. The goal here is to get them off the scent of something or to make them think a certain way that is misleading. 
Um, so that's kind of an important distinction to make is that when we're talking about um, disinformation and misinformation, we look at the purpose. And in my head, I kind of think of this as um, how we can have these different purposes and how they can kind of spring from one another, such that if we have um, someone who is sharing misinformation, they might not be sharing it with the purpose of misleading. I think of this as sort of how, how disinformation can then flow and become misinformation. So some entity might spread misinformation with the purpose of misleading. We'll talk a little bit about the book Merchants of Doubt um, and how purposeful misinformation in the tobacco realm as well as the climate change realm have had these effects. But then people take that and spread it, not necessarily with the purpose of misleading, but with the purpose of educating others in their mind and sharing this information that is seen as important. So taking a detour, um, this is my advisor, Ed Maybach at the Center for Climate Change Communication, likes to describe climate change in 10 words, and that is climate change is real, it is us or it is human caused, it is bad, scientists agree on these first three things and then there's hope if we act quickly if we act now so keep these in the back of your mind as i go into the next slide and we'll see how climate misinformation that's out there almost directly counters each of these elements of climate change in 10 words this is the cards taxonomy of climate misinformation um, and I will be able to share these slides with all of you. Um, so if this is a little bit small, I apologize. I will share the slides so you can zoom in a little bit. Um, but we're focusing here on that top row, these five claims of climate misinformation. That first one is that global warming is not happening. So directly kind of a counterpoint to it. it's real. Um, Number two is that human greenhouse gases are not causing global warming, so that directly contradicts it's us. Um, number three, climate impacts are not bad, um, so that's directly in, or directly countering it's bad. Four and five are kind of the most common um, right now. Studies have shown that these are becoming the ones that you're going to come across most often. So number four is that climate solutions won't work. That kind of is a little bit of a counter to the idea that there's hope, um, but we have all these different sub claims underneath that claim. And then the fifth one is that the climate movement or climate science, climate scientists are unreliable. And uh, the CARDS taxonomy goes into each of these in um, a little bit greater detail. Some of the specific claims that fall under each of these categories. So, for example, the claim that Antarctica isn't melting would fall under number one. Um, the claim that the sun is causing climate change is going to fall under number two. Um, the claim that species can adapt, which is one that you'll see in an example later in my presentation, is going to fall under number three. Um, this idea that green jobs don't work falling under number four. Um, or politicians being biased, alarmism is going to fall under number five. So um, I just wanted to take a moment and introduce you all to this. Again, I'll share my slides, um, but you can see here how we're kind of directly paralleling um, these the climate change in 10 words that Ed uses frequently. So I want to think about why misinformation is so powerful. Um, and a big part of it has to do with this idea of a lack of what's called slow thinking. Um, this is from the book Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, which is by Daniel Kahneman, published in 2011. And he talks about two different sort of systems that humans use to think. The first, or system one, is automatic processing. This is stuff that you don't even have to think about. Your drive to work. Uh, your morning routine, maybe how you make your coffee in the morning. This is very low effort. You, you're you basically not thinking about it, very subconscious. This automatic processing when we're thinking about misinformation is going to rely on mental models, which we'll talk about, as well as pre-existing beliefs. So the way that people see the world, 
really plays into how they process information that they're going to come across out on the internet, in the news, in conversations, so on and so forth. Then we have system two, which is more effortful processing. This requires a lot of cognitive effort and we call it slow thinking because it takes more time. This is solving a math problem, getting really involved in a project, something that you really have to apply yourself in order to do. So this requires that conscious effort. When we're doing system two thinking, we're not relying on mental models, we're not relying on existing beliefs, we're not relying on routines, we're really engaging with whatever information is in front of us. So part of these things that play into system one thinking, uh, the first is confirmation bias. So people are more inclined to believe something that aligns with those existing beliefs. So when we're engaged in system one thinking, we often fall victim to this confirmation bias because if something clicks and aligns with what we already think, we're going to believe it. Part of system one thinking is also credibility cues. And a big one here, and we'll talk about social media in a moment, but this is that people believe information when it's shared by someone that they trust. So if you see a friend share something on social media, or if you see a trusted news outlet, a trusted uh, newscaster, meteorologist, other content creator that you trust, you are more likely to believe it if someone you trust is sharing it. So that credibility cue bypasses that slow, effortful thinking, and subconsciously, automatically, people believe something because it's been shared by someone that they trust or have a relationship with. We also have to do or deal with uncertainties. When people believe a situation is uncertain, they're more likely to consider conflicting information. And this is where we get into uh, the book Merchants of Doubt, but this is that the techniques used by um, people who are spreading disinformation, so that purposeful misinformation, is to cast doubt or highlight uncertainty. And this becomes then a gateway that people are more likely to consider conflicting information when there is doubt being created about it. Uh, we often see this, for example, with consensus on climate change and when people say that scientists don't agree on whatever it is about climate change then that makes people more inclined to believe misinformation because they don't believe that there is consensus. So that's kind of an underlying reason that misinformation is powerful, is that people are more likely to believe it when they don't think that there is certainty. And when we talk about these uncertainties, we're very much talking about creating false uncertainty. So um, as many of us I'm sure know, there are ways in which we are not certain about various impacts of climate change. We're maybe not sure exactly what it might do to hurricanes, maybe not quite sure exactly what it would do to tornadoes and thunderstorm creation. Um, there are things that we are more certain of and things that we are less certain of. But when we're talking about these uncertainties, we're talking about creating uncertainty on things that are settled. A good parallel to this is the flat earth myth and creating that doubt when really things are settled that the earth is a sphere. We'll also talk, let me get rid of my little annotation here. Um, I've mentioned a little bit about mental models and we'll go into those a little bit more detail later, but it, um, those are a reason that misinformation is so powerful because people will hold on to beliefs that make a complete mental model, um, which I'll go into in a moment. 
So how does misinformation spread? A lot of it goes through social media. Um, posts or information that are shared by friends, like I said before, are automatically viewed as credible. Someone you trust is sharing the information, it must be true. We also have this idea of um, people sharing something that is interesting if true. So someone reads something and maybe the headline says something that is very attention grabbing, very interesting, and maybe they read it and the article kind of goes into how this is not necessarily true, but might be interesting if it is, but people share it without necessarily verifying that it is true, but they think, wouldn't this be cool? And that is a lot of how misinformation gets picked up is without that check or even without um, people might not acknowledge that they're sharing it because it's interesting if it's true and then it's automatically seen as true. And then one that I'm sure we're familiar with, clickbait headlines, headlines that really grab attention are very easy and quick to spread. And this is just on the user side of social media. So we're talking about individual users of social media and those dynamics, who they view as credible and what people are likely to care. But the technical side of social media also has a lot to do with how misinformation spreads. These two are kind of the two main um, key points up here. The first is algorithm. So people are shown information that reinforces what they've already clicked on. If you are clicking on articles that are climate misinformation, you are going to be more likely to see climate misinformation. If you are clicking on memes of Baby Yoda, they're going to keep showing you memes of Baby Yoda. Guilty. Um, but the algorithm really picks up on what you're interested in, what you're engaging with, and what you're clicking on, and then kind of creates an echo chamber of sorts where people are then shown things that reinforce what they're interested in or what they believe. Then we also have a lack of moderation or even slow moderation. And this is uh, was kind of the focus of the work that I did with the climate.gov social media team and how it's important to go through and debunk misinformation. It spreads virally, it spreads very quickly. Um, this is a quote from Foolproof by Sandra Vanderlinden, which just came out this year, it's a great book. Um, but millions of people can be exposed to misinformation in a matter of days, if not minutes. The internet works very quickly and often even quicker than fact checking can work. Um, so even if people are going in and moderating and fact checking, information spreads so quickly that it can be hard to keep up with that. So these are the two sort of sides of social media that are helping misinformation to spread algorithms and echo chambers, as well as moderation issues and the sheer speed that it's spreading. We've also seen um, this idea of false debate in the news media. So there's an ethic in journalism of balanced reporting, presenting both sides of an issue. And that's great in some senses. When we're talking about matters of opinion, sometimes matters of policy or politics, where there's really important to cover two different ways of thought. But this has also happened with presenting both sides of an issue where there aren't really two legitimate sides. Think climate change, flat earth, par um, harms of tobacco and smoking. So for example, we have down here, a climate scientist and an engineer might be debating climate science on a news program where one person is clearly much more qualified to discuss climate change. We don't see this often anymore. Um, a lot of journalism is kind of recognizing the damage that this can do to give equal platforms when one person or one side has more science behind it, is more scientifically legitimate, is more based in fact, um, but it has been influential in giving sort of a platform and giving legitimacy to this idea that climate science is heavily debated. So we've talked a little bit about how misinformation spreads and what is it, and we've talked about how misinformation is viral. It spreads quickly from person to person, much like a virus. 
So we vaccinate against it in order to combat it. And this is a great time um, for me to be discussing inoculation theory and vaccination because we're all very familiar by now um, with how vaccination works. So the way a vaccination works, right, is by exposing people to a weakened version of a virus that builds immunity. So if we have a person. And that's going to make them immune to the effects of the virus by being exposed to this weak virus. The immune system is able to recognize that virus and fight against it. Inoculation theory says that we can inoculate or convey resistance to misinformation pretty much exactly the same way by exposing the audience to a weakened form of misinformation. And this is how we weaken the misinformation. We are pointing out that the misinformation is false. And then really importantly, we are explaining how that misinformation is misleading or explaining the fallacious reasoning that is at work in that misinformation. So just like uh, with the biological inoculation, by exposing people and showing them how that misinformation is false, we are then able to convey resistance and they're able to resist that misinformation claim in the future because they have been exposed to that weakened version and they have seen how it does not compute, how it's a logical fallacy. This is another taxonomy um, for you to check out, but this is misinformation techniques or ways that misinformation is misleading. It's called flick for the first letters of each of these techniques, fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking and conspiracy theories. So each of these have their subsets, specific techniques uh, that, are in, that are used in misinformation claims. Uh, some of them might sound familiar, like a straw man, an ad hominem. I've talked about false debate. Um, cherry picking is probably familiar. Um, this ideas of conspiracy theories. Um, but this really helps us classify with this taxonomy what logical fallacy is at work. And then we're able to use that in debunking and be able to point that out when we are giving that inoculation message and showing a weakened version of misinformation. So again, I don't want to spend too much time on this slide in particular. Uh, the slides will go out, but this is a really helpful way to classify the ways that misinformation is misleading. And we use that to build a truth sandwich. So this is how an inoculation message is built. This is how we weaken that misinformation. And this is the vaccine, if you will, that people are given when we are working to inoculate them against a misinformation claim. So we leave with the fact, making it simple and concrete. We warn that there is a myth. Then we explain how that myth is misleading. And then finish by reinforcing the fact. Um, John Cook, who is um, a very gifted, wonderful misinformation scholar, part of my dissertation committee, um, likes to maybe call this a fallacy sandwich on truth bread because the truth is not the meat of the sandwich, um, which is why I put truth sandwich in quotes here. Um, but this is how we build those messages. This is what it looks like to weaken misinformation by explaining how it's misleading. And I have an example on the next slide color-coded, so the fact is blue, the myth or the warning about the myth is in red, the fallacy is in green. Um, so if you just keep that in your back pocket here, this is an example of what that message would look like in practice. This is something that someone might post in a comment section, post as a reply to somebody, um, or give this message as an inoculation. So the fact, 
Unfortunately, Earth's climate is changing too quickly for many species to be able to adapt. Then we introduce the myth. You may have heard the myth that plants and animals can easily adapt to current changes. And then we explain the fallacy. So we say this isn't true. Plants and animals can adapt to slow changes that occur over thousands of years, but today's climate change is happening much faster. It's only taking about 100 years. So this explains what is wrong about that myth. And then we reinforce the fact this change is happening too fast for species to adapt. And that's what, inoc what an inoculation message is going to look like. This is how we weaken the misinformation that plants and animals can easily adapt to current changes by explaining that plants and animals can adapt to slow change, but we're seeing fast change. So what we're doing here is we are breaking and fixing audience mental models. And this is where it gets, um, this is kind of the most important part is that fixing of the mental models. So going back to this idea that there's no scientific consensus on climate change, someone's mental model here with all these gears, um, so the gear in Navy on the left, there's no scientific consensus on climate change because there are scientists who disagree. This is a complete mental model. It makes sense. It is logical. Um, and someone will hold on to this because it's a complete mental model that explains the situation. If you just tell someone that there is scientific consensus that climate change is human caused, you're taking a gear out of that mental model. So I have this because, this is a complete mental model, this is not. We need a why in order for our debunking to stick. And that's why the explaining of the fallacy is so important. We have to replace that mental model that we've broken and then go ahead and fix it with the truth. So we can't just leave it and we cannot just say there's scientific consensus, cool, we're done here, could, because that leaves a gap and then people will go right back and fill that gap in with the myth, with the misinformation. So we break it and we fix it. So the fixed mental model says there is scientific consensus that climate change is human caused. And then when we fixed it, we emphasize that scientists who disagree do not have expertise in climate science. So now we have fixed that. It's a complete mental model again and people are more likely to hold on to that because it can make sense logically and um, we've completed the mental model. A couple of other um, just general best practices for combating misinformation. The first is to check the source, engaging your own system to thinking so that your audience doesn't have to. Is the author an expert? If they're not an expert, what sources are they citing? Are they citing legitimate scientific sources? Who's the publisher or sponsor? Do they have some kind of motive that would, inc that would indicate that they are spreading disinformation? Read an article before sharing it. Is this interesting if true? Is the headline clickbait? And then using fact-checking websites before sharing information, such as Snopes. And then I'll introduce our, there's a link to Skeptical Science, which is a, um, this is climate change myth debunking. So the people who work on Skeptical Science have spent quite a lot of time. Um, they go through and they debunk climate myths in that fact myth fallacy fact structure so you can always go to skeptical science for climate change myths and there will be an explanation of that myth and why it's misleading ready um, for you to use and i add these because as people who worked in noaa there is a little bit of a sense of responsibility right that you want to share good information with whoever it is you're talking to whether you are working on social media or whether you want to share something within your personal circle, these are ways that you can get the work done and share legitimate information with whatever audience you are working to share it with. And of course, why is this important? Why are we here today? Uh, why am I working on misinformation? Um, and it's because 
this can have really major consequences. We might think that it's just something that happens on social media or silly things that happen on the internet, but we've seen, especially with COVID and climate change, that this can have really massive consequences. COVID, I think, is kind of the most um, recent and easy to think about example because we've seen it happen in real time. We've seen how misinformation on COVID resulted in low vaccination rates, resulted in people not masking and other health and safety practices. And we saw how that prolonged the pandemic and prolonged um, this sort of isolation, social distancing, all of that. We saw how that spread it out. Um, so having that real time experience is really, um, really puts this into concrete, um, <clears throat> a concrete example of how misinformation can really go so much farther than Facebook, Twitter, the internet, what have you. Um, and climate change, this is happening, it's a little bit harder to see in real time because we, um, you know, the impacts are, um, we're, they're, they're here, but they're a little bit more um, in the future. But these doubts that are happening because of misinformation are delaying the really important actions that we need. Because we have this misinformation, we're not getting done what needs to get done. So um, we're also seeing how those delays are now kind of catching up with us and delaying the actions. And we are now seeing some of these effects that have been predicted for climate change. So a couple of resources that are linked. Um, again, I'll share the slides. The first is Skeptical Science, which is that climate myth debunking website. They do a really great, really thorough job, and it's a great resource to have in your back pocket um, for debunking these claims that you come across. The Center for Climate Change Communication also has our handbook hub. Um, so the climate myth debunking for broadcast meteorologists handbook is one that I worked on a couple summers ago. It is geared towards broadcasters, but anyone can use it as a tool book for how to debunk climate change myths. And then the debunking handbook 2020 goes a little bit more broad, does not focus necessarily on climate myths, um, but goes a little bit deeper into how to debunk misinformation. Um, I have a Google Doc link of the references that are for this presentation. It's also my dissertation references, so it's a lot of references, um, but you are welcome to open that Google Doc if you'd like to see any of the sources that I um, cited in parentheticals in these slides, or if you're just interested and you would like to um, learn more, there's so many resources in that references doc. And then the last one is the Cranky Uncle Inoculation Game, where you are actually playing a game that teaches you how to spot logical fallacies in misinformation. This is created by Dr. John Cook. He is now working on expanding it with UNICEF and expanding it globally. Um, but you play through as someone who is um, someone who believes in misinformation, and you go through and you learn how to identify fake experts, cherry picking all kinds of different logical fallacies and conspiracy messaging techniques. Um, so that's also a really good one to play through. Um, it's interesting and it's also been shown to be very effective at teaching people how to resist misinformation. And as an inoculation tool, it's very effective. So with that, um, I'd like to thank Tom and Katie again for having me and you all uh, for joining today and listening to my ramblings on misinformation. Um, also like to thank my dissertation committee who are um, supporting me as I go through this work. Um, and that's Ed Maybach, John Cook, Chris Clark, and Kevin Wright at George Mason. Uh, my contact info is on the bottom bar of these slides, but I've also put it here. Um, and I know that was a lot of information. So if you feel like our friend, this lady in this image, I'm happy to answer questions here um, as we have time, or you can also connect with me on email, Twitter, or LinkedIn. So with that, I will stop my share. And take questions. Thank you so much, Margaret. This was awesome.
as a reminder for everyone on the call, if you have a question, please place that in the question panel and we will get to them as soon as we can. And we may not get to all questions um, in this present, I mean, in their time we have, but we will be going through as in the order of the questions that we did receive. So I'm gonna start with the first question, which is who or what determines what is misinformation? That's a good question. Um, I would say the if I if you think back to that first slide with the definitions of misinformation, where misinformation is defined as something that goes against best available scientific evidence without its own scientific justification. Um, so in this case, I think for climate misinformation specifically, that's defined by what is being published in the peer reviewed atmospheric science, climate change, climate science literature. So if it doesn't align with what is peer reviewed and what is um, legitimate science, then it would be misinformation. And it gets a little bit more hairy when we get into this idea of policy, um, because there are different sides of policy. Policy is a less concrete scientific issue but we can look at trials of what has worked with solutions. Um, so the my simple answer to that, even though it's not necessarily um, a simple concrete answer, would be that who gets to define misinformation is the peer-reviewed scientific literature and what that says. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, I think this leads a little bit into our next question. Um, the crux of the problem for misinformation uh, seems to be that the public hears that science can change or science changes a position and that can be a challenge to the validity of the science as a whole. How do we respond to that? So I think um, I think that that's def that is definitely sort of the crux of the issue is that people know that science can change. Um, I think it's important to give context into how science changes and that process um, so that and we're, we get in a little bit to like scientific literacy here and this idea of being able to discern the process of science and how science changes. Um, but for me, I think part of that is focusing on what we know and focusing on how it has not changed. And um, so, for example, we know that the climate is warming and we know that we need to do something about it. So we focus on that and what we know quite well. Um, the working and communicating about the scientific process and how science changes is definitely very, very difficult, but I think it has to do with increasing science literacy, which maybe starts in K-12 or college classrooms and learning more about the process of science and the process of peer review. And I think also highlighting that idea of peer review is that um, it is not, um, that it takes a lot for science and scientific views to change. We learn a lot about like, how the um, how we used to think that Earth was the center of the universe, and then it was changed. So we learn in school quite a lot about how science changes, but we um, should focus on what is required to make science change. If that um, kind of makes sense, it's it's definitely very sticky and something that I'm really interested in working on, maybe in the future. Um, but in communicating my more simple, less rambly answer to that question might be to focus on um, looking at these claims and the process behind them and to say that if you are going to change science, is it coming from rigorous science or is it not coming from rigorous science? I hope that helps. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, I think this directly leads to this question. How do you then inspire people to use that system to thinking? Uh, most people seem to be happy where they are because uh, it's very easy or comfortable. Yeah, it is very easy. It is very comfortable. Um, a lot of that has to do, I think, with 
um, there, I think there's two parts to it. Part of it is capitalizing on a relationship or rapport so that if you are able to speak with someone, you're more likely to change the mind of someone that you already have a rapport with. Um, so having those discussions and interpersonal discussions can go a long way in that. Um, but also by making it a little bit easier for people to engage in that system to thinking. So these inoculation messages that um, and changing around those mental models, the inoculation message is pretty simple. Um, it doesn't have to be this long, drawn out news article. It can be as simple as species are not able to adapt in the short time frame that we're seeing climate change. Um, so we're kind of making it easier for people to engage in that system to thinking by using those inoculation messages. So instead of sitting people down and saying like, you know, you need to fact check and here is all these websites that you can go through to fact check and read an entire article before you retweet it. We give them this tool that they are able then to make to kind of almost change your system one processing through these simple debunking messages that we're using. Thank you, Margaret. Um, with that, how do you separate misinformation from reasonable scientific uncertainty? Reasonable scientific uncertainty definitely has to do with going into the literature. Um, I love how the IPCC has their sort of certainty levels. We are virtually certain that the planet is warming. We are less certain about little nuances of climate change and climate change impacts. Um, in messaging, we focus on the certainties and then we can get into a little bit more nuanced discussion on the uncertainties. Um, I don't want to say avoid the uncertainties because that's not what we want to do in our communication. We want to acknowledge those uncertainties. Um, but the misinformation is what has to do with the big claims. The misinformation is the climate is not changing. The misinformation is humans are not the cause. Um, so we're kind of, when we're dealing with misinformation, we're usually dealing with those bigger, better, better proven claims. And then the legitimate scientific uncertainty happens more in the literature and happens, um, more within the science itself. So when we're communicating about that, um, I would say that we focus on what is more settled and what is more certain. And then when we get those really tough questions about those uncertainties, it's important to flesh those out and say like, this is what some of the science is saying, but also to bring it back to the key, um, the key fact. So one of the, um, you know, we get into this idea that we don't exactly know how climate change is going to impact tornadoes. So let's hold off on doing something about it until we know exactly how it's going to impact tornadoes. That's kind of um, a left turn, a red herring um, away from the core issue that we are seeing climate change. We're seeing impacts. We're seeing devastating consequences from climate change. So we don't want to wait to do something about it if we are already seeing these impacts. So it's kind of a twofold of acknowledging the uncertainties in our communication and talking with nuance about those uncertainties, but also talking about what we know. And um, if you're talking about climate change, especially how what we know leads us to what we need to do. Thanks, Margaret. Um, what advice would you give to folks who are just learning to communicate this to the public, um, say at a visitor center, uh, those staff and volunteers? It can be really, really tough to do this on the fly. Um, I, I've, I'm, I'm like obviously steeped in it. This is what I do. Um, but when you're confronted with misinformation that you're especially, maybe that you're not entirely sure how to debunk it is quite terrifying. Um, so I think the first step, if you go to the Skeptical Science website, they have like the most common climate misinformation claims, and that's a really good place to start. These are the claims that you might see most often. 
Um, and then you can kind of have those in your back pocket, familiarizing yourself with them, um, being ready to pull them out if you get those questions. You can also have those resources ready to provide to people if you don't have a full explanation prepared, especially in sort of a visitor center type situation, um, to be able to say, why don't you check out skeptical science or what have you. Um, but I think when you're just getting started, it's really good to sort of know those most common misinformation claims, um, familiarizing yourself with them. You don't necessarily have to have a script, but um, good to sort of familiarize yourself with those things. And then just um, also being organic and personable. Um, Another one of the things that I found when I was working on my report for the Climate Duck of social media team was the importance of that personable interaction. So you being willing to answer those questions will go a long way, whether it is whether you are able to specifically counter that misinformation or whether you say, here's what I know, check out this other source, that personal interaction is going to go a long way. Okay, so our next question uh, is, are there different, you were talking about um, how to, it's hard to do this on the fly, but are there different methods for different types of interactions, such you're meeting someone at the outreach event, but then you're at the grocery store? What, are there different methods for folks here? It's a good question. I think social media does lend itself to kind of the um, the messages that I showed with the colors in my presentation, that you're able to type out this comment and have someone read it. On the fly is very different, where you don't want to sound super rehearsed, right? Um, I think when I come across misinformation in sort of an interpersonal situation like that, um, I'm I'm sort of doing that in a more condensed manner and especially bringing your credentials into that as well. So like I would I am trained in climate science. I'm also trained in misinformation. And here is sort of what's um, not you don't want to say like here's what's wrong with that. But here is um, so sort of taking that inoculation message and condensing it. I wouldn't say there's necessarily completely different methods. You're, it's always a good idea to kind of think about that truth sandwich when you're trying to counter misinformation. It's definitely going to look different across social media versus someone you meet in the grocery store. Um, and I also think in any situation that empathy is going to go a long way um, and not being condescending, which again is um, it's nuanced, but um, it'll it will look different. Um, I'm trying to think of the last time I had to give this um, give this verbally, um, but a very like a very simple explanation. So if I were explaining to someone in the grocery store or someone I had just met um, that I, I will always tend to fall back on the scientists don't agree myth because um, it's been very heavily studied in misinformation literature. Um, but to say that, so if someone were to say like, oh, scientists don't agree on that, I could say something like, oh, so that's, um, that's a very common thing to think because a lot of people or a lot of scientists who don't have expertise in climate change are chiming in. And when you look at only scientists who are involved and trained in climate science, they are agreeing. Um, so really simplifying those messages is going to be important when you have those kinds of personal interactions. Thanks, Margaret. That is very helpful. Um, speaking of your work in in social media are there some platforms that are worse than others if we need to prioritize our debunking efforts is it better to focus on one social media platform over another i think in a lot of um 
I don't know that I've looked at a com like so this is essentially this is more anecdotal, but I would think based on the way the platforms work, Facebook is a really good place for debunking because it is easier when you're scrolling through to see what people are commenting. That kind of sometimes gets hidden on Twitter, especially if it's a longer back and forth or if you aren't following the person who's commenting. Um, one of the, the one of the key audiences, if not the key audience when you're debunking on social media is not the person who posted the misinformation. It is the person reading the interaction. So, for example, if climate.gov has posted something and someone, as they do, has posted misinformation in a comment, someone is going to be come across that reading a comment thread there. It's a little bit more easily visible on Facebook. And then when they see that climate.gov has responded to that, those lurkers are going to see that. You're never you're not going to get the people who are truly deeply ingrained in belief in the misinformation enough to comment it on that Facebook post. But it is important to then reply for the lurkers, the scrollers, the people who aren't engaging in the conversation necessarily, but will see that information. Um, so Anecdotally, I would say Facebook just because of how much easier it is to see those comments and back and forths. Um, I would probably say that Twitter would be second um, again because it's a little bit easier to see those comments. Um, I'm not so sure about Instagram, um, but my my anecdotal gut would say Facebook. Thanks, Margaret. We're going to grab a few more questions before the end of the hour. So this next one is, with so much mis- and disinformation regarding hot topics, such as climate change, do you think it is useful to combat some of the myths without using the term climate change and related buzzwords? If so, is there a good protocol for using the sandwich method without highlighting these terms if the terms are present or implied in the myth? I think if the terms are present in the myth, you'll have to use them because um, you'll need to directly counter that. Um, I think it's hard to it's it's hard to communicate with those buzzwords, right? Because they're going to get people riled up um, in one form or another. But you also don't necessarily want to dodge those terms if that is the term that's being used in the myth. Um, if someone is saying climate change is not real, you don't want to necessarily dodge the term in your response. I think if you are making an original post, there's a little bit more wiggle room, but that depends on the myth that you are debunking in that original post. Um, you know, if you if we want to go back to that myth about species adaptation, that's a little bit easier to say. Um, instead of climate change, you could say like changes in Earth's climate, changes in weather patterns, changes in temperature. Um, but it's kind of really on a myth to myth basis on whether you avoid using those buzzwords. But those buzzwords also describe what is happening. Um, so I would say don't ne ne don't necessarily be too afraid of them. Thanks, Maria. Um, okay, looking for one or two questions to finish us up here. Um, in your research, uh, do you know of, of research that examines how breaking mental models works better or worse depending on who the messenger is? Yes. Um, I'm sure that those papers are in that references. Google Doc that's linked in the slides, um, but it does often depend on the messenger, and that's something that I'm going to examine in my um, in my dissertation. But there's a huge dimension of trust, which is why um, if I were to do so with a friend of mine or a family member or someone I know, it might be a little bit more effective than with someone I don't know. Um, or with someone who doesn't trust my credentials. So there's definitely a huge impact on the source of 
the debunking and I am hoping that I can come back to you um, in a year and say that, you know, people who are trusted, I'm going to be looking at broadcast meteorologists, doctors and uh, climate scientists. So I'm hoping that those are basically universally trusted sources across the political spectrum. Um, somebody who maybe politically leans right is going to trust certain people versus someone who politically leans left. Um, but those are sources and there are sources out there that are trusted across the political spectrum. So it is going to depend on the source, but fortunately there are pretty universally trusted sources that we can work with. Great, thank you so much. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and it might be a little can of worms, but we can punt that to the next seminar on Thursday. Do you see AI making things worse or better in regards to this? Ooh. <laughs> um. I think it can go, it's going to sound like a cop out, but I think it can go both ways. Um, Cause I know that um, John Cook in some of his studies has been working on using chat GPT. Um, he hasn't used it directly in a study, but when we've been looking at how to formulate messages for my own dissertation study, Sometimes we might ask ChatGPT, like debunk this myth in a, and we like give it parameters and we see how it, um, how it debunks that myth. So I have no evidence or studies on that, but I do know that we're kind of exploring using it as a tool to generate debunkings for myths. On the flip side, it can be used in exactly the same way to generate misinformation. Um, so I think we just as, as with most AI issues, have to kind of be careful about where it leads. Um, could also be useful. There are papers, and you can find them in my references, that are using AI to detect misinformation um, and kind of go through and work as quickly as social media spreads. Um, so it's a bit of a cop out, but it can go, I think, both ways. And it's definitely something that is being investigated and will continue to be investigated in this realm. Thank you so much, Margaret. This was amazing and such a great talk. We have a ton more questions that we can't get to in the time, but I do want to remind everyone that this is a two-part series, so please register for the second half of this talk. Um, it, it's going to be delivered by our introductor today, Tom DiLiberto, who is going to be talking from NOAA's perspective. This one is called How Does Climate.gov Talk Climate and Deal with Misinformation? So Tom DiLiberto is going to be joined by Rebecca Lindsay, who is going to, who are both from the climate.gov team and will be talking about climate science from NOAA and how they are approaching misinformation. And we'll put into the chat for everyone the registration link for that talk. Thank you all for coming and for your great questions. We will be following up on all of these questions and sending out a kind of blanket answer to several of them uh, via the email you provided. And that will go out to everyone along with recording and the slides from today. Thank you again, Margaret, so much. Please join us on Thursday, same time, noon Eastern. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day.